Um, hello, good morning, and we are the Surrey Biodiversity Team. Today we'll be talking a lot more about our project in partnership with the City of Surrey. Um, essentially, we are assessing urban wildlife through the prism of citizen science. So uh, let me introduce ourselves. This is Camilo, I'm Alex, this is Julia, and um, we're very excited to talk about biodiversity today. So first off, here's what we'll be talking about today. First, I'll be giving you a brief background introduction on like, you know, biodiversity, some background information you need to know in the city of Surrey. We'll talk about the aims of our project, and then we'll work out oh, right. And then, oh, and then we'll um, get into more of the results and the main findings of our project. Then we'll also talk a little bit about the limitations and things we've discovered and some further action that we can do in the future. And then of course, there will be a question period afterwards. Yes, okay, so let me just give you a bit of background information about our biodiversity project, starting with a very important definition. So what is biodiversity? Biodiversity, essentially uh, biological diversity, is the variety of all living organisms, the environment, and the interactions between them. And why is it important? It provides things called ecosystem services. So this is breathable air, potable water, carbon storage, climate regulation, and a lot of more things. But the thing is, nowadays, biodiversity loss is increasing primarily due to human activity. Things like land conversion, pollution, climate change, and more drive habitat loss, and over-exploitation, like overfishing, overhunting, can also negatively affect populations. And when ecosystems are drastically changed by human activity, just like they are now, this leads to biodiversity loss, and consequently, this negatively affects the ecosystem services that humanity relies on. And our project is in partnership with the city of Surrey, so we want to study biodiversity in Surrey. It is Metro Vancouver Regional District's fastest growing municipality, Unfortunately, not the fastest in BC, but we, we had to fact check ourselves based on our last presentation. And they have a wide variety of wildlife habitats and environmentally sensitive areas like wetlands, bird nesting grounds, and waterways. So Surrey is also really rich in biodiversity and is home to a variety of freshwater fish, different bird species, amphibians, and mammals. And under, um, to protect all of these creatures and sensitive habitats, Surrey is one of the few cities in Canada that has something called a biodiversity conservation plan. And um, understanding how this plan is being achieved is really important for future development decisions. So to talk more about this biodiversity conservation plan or the biodiversity conservation strategy, it was established in 2014 with the aim of preserving, protecting, and enhancing city biodiversity. And so it has some, some of these main goals that you can see up on the slide here, and we want to investigate how these goals are being achieved. One of the pillars of the biodiversity conservation strategy is this thing called the Green Infrastructure Network. It's an interconnected network of green spaces and nature areas that are optimized for biodiversity conservation. So this green infrastructure network is basically a bunch of land that has been set aside and it's meant to guide future decisions in land acquisition, development, conservation, and city management actions. It consists of three main components, essentially hubs, which are very large core areas that you can see here. Oh, laser pointer. Ooh, hubs, which are these big areas here. Um, corridors, which connect large hubs and allow for movement of creatures and animals between them, and sites, which are basically smaller versions of hubs. And so on this next slide, we have a map of the Surrey Gen. No, do we still have that? I don't think so. Yeah, so hubs, sites, and corridors. So another really important pillar of the biodiversity conservation strategy is biodiversity monitoring. So monitoring is basically done by examining the occurrence and abundance of species and is often logistically difficult. And this is where citizen science comes in. Citizen science projects are essentially research projects that are conducted in collaboration with everyday people. And so the city of Surrey has its own citizen science initiative where Surrey residents are encouraged to contribute to data sets using platforms like iNaturalist and eBirds. 
Essentially, you take a picture of a creature uploaded to a database and other people and other citizen scientists can help identify what this creature is. And using this database, scientists around the world can use all of this data to conduct their own research. So essentially, um, Surrey has also hosted BioBlitz events like the City Nature Challenge, where they try to encourage citizens to get into citizen science and contribute to these data sets. And this data set is the main focus of our team's project. Moving on to the actual project itself, because that was a lot of background information, our main problem here is that Surrey's landscape is changing drastically and dramatically, which has really serious implications for biodiversity and conservation in Surrey. As you can see in the images here, we have two neighborhoods, Glenmore and Vintera Street, something like that. And there's very large demand for land development. And as you can see, the landscape has changed really dramatically over time, where what these once green areas that had a lot of trees and coverage have become more developed and full of a lot of houses. So today, habitat loss caused by land development is one of the largest risks to Surrey's biodiversity. And the main goal of our of the city biodiversity planning team is to maintain the city's biodiversity through initiatives like the BCS and the GIN. So our project will be relying or will be uh, analyzing relevant spatial and attribute data to evaluate the city's priorities and to provide and hopefully we want to protect the city's biodiversity. So we have six main outcomes to achieve or main aims to achieve this. The first thing we would like to do is explore the biodiversity of the city using our citizen science data, so an initial look at it. We want to evaluate the occurrence and distribution of indicator species. Of, oh, sorry. We want to identify biodiversity hotspots and then evaluate the occurrence and distribution of indicator species and species at risk. We also want to assess the current state of the gin and build a biodiversity atlas for the city of Surrey using our available occurrence data. And we will also want to compile this data and basically draft some guidelines to work on connectivity analysis for the city of Surrey in the future. And that way we could also compare that connectivity to the existing gym. So moving on to our first main finding, which has to do with species occurrence data. Um, so we have a few initial background information about the data sources we have in this project. A lot of our data is from citizen science platforms, iNaturalist and eBird, and they're from the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Our data does span 2011 to 2021, so just about a decade, although the eBird data does only go up to 2020 since the data is only released publicly once a year. And um, we also have iNaturalist observations are considered research grade, while eBird ob observations have no grading. So we essentially just rely on the um, the quality of the eBird data set, but we'll talk more about limitations later. And as we can kind of see here, the activity on both platforms is increasing in both our number of overall observations and in our number of users overall. So this, I think, is a testament to how the city of Surrey's initiative and in pushing citizens to get involved is really working because we're seeing a lot more activity on both ends for both data sets. And we are also able to look further into this occurrence data set by investigating how many our number of in observations for very important bird species. These are called indicator species, but we'll talk more about those later. We can plot raw observations over time, and we can kind of see that it looks like all of these populations are increasing. The thing is, we don't know for sure if this is a result of population increase or if there's just more people using the app. And that, that could just mean more people are seeing birds but it doesn't necessarily mean there are more birds. So we can correct for this by looking for the frequency of observations for each of the species, basically taking the proportion of the total number of observations that each species accounts for. And that can kind of show us a few patterns where some species show like some increases, like the song sparrow here. Some have a decrease, like the downy woodpecker, but some also kind of stay about the same or they just go up and down. And with these frequency calculations, we are also able to identify more rare or newer species based on their observation frequencies. We can also see where these species, these observations all occur. And this is what all of the city, all of our species occurrence data looks like all around the city of Surrey. As you can kind of see, they're like all clustered around green areas, around here, here, down here. And those are essentially parks. This is evidence of some sort of sampling bias because we have a lot of users who just go to the park to take pictures of birds 
or other animals and not necessarily take pictures perhaps in their own backyards or on the sidewalk or near the mall or something like that. So with these citizen science data, we need to keep in mind that there's uneven recording intensity over time, uneven spatial coverage, and uneven sampling effort. So that's a limitation we can talk about more later. The second aim of our project was to identify biodiversity hotspots in the city of Surrey, and we can investigate species richness using our species occurrence data. Species richness is defined as the number of unique species in one area, and it's often used as a measure of biodiversity. Here we've broken Surrey into blocks and calculated species richness for each, and as you can see, just like earlier, there were, a little, there were clusters of much darker areas where we have very high species richness. And these areas are actually major parks in the city, such as the Green Timbered Urban Forest, the Surrey Lake Park, Fleetwood Park, and Blackie Spit Park. With further investigation, we also looked, found that these, are, these biodiversity hotspots often have some sort of unique and sensitive habitat like wetlands. And Blackie Spit Park, for example, is actually an important stop for migratory birds along the Pacific Flyway since they travel along the coast for the winter and stuff, yeah. Another um, aim of our project was to investigate the occurrence of indicator species and species at risk. So what are indicator species? They are essentially species that act as proxies for ecosystem health. Their presence and abundance reflect the health of their environment and the Surrey team has 27 different indicator species. We're able to subsample our data set for just uh, indicator species, and here we've actually plotted the song sparrow on the left and the eastern gray squirrel on the right. Now, we're able to do this for all of the indicator species, but what you can see, they do follow some patterns of being kind of clustered around the green areas as well. And we can also take a look at species at risk, which is a different set of important species that are essentially in danger of extinction. These species can also be really important indicators of ecosystem health because species loss is a bad thing when it comes to biodiversity. And we are also able to look at different categorizations. So the Sarah list is the Species at Risk Act established in 2002. The federal government has defined a list of species at risk, categorizes endangered, threatened, and special concern. So we have this many uh, species in Surrey. And the provincial list is the provincial government's version of that. As you can see, the numbers are kind of different. That's because they're not actually consistent lists with each other. So it's important to plot both of those and investigate them separately. And using our occurrence data, we can see that they all occur in these areas in Surrey, which once again are just like the biodiversity hotspots that we have seen. So well, I can pass it on to Yulia to talk more about the green infrastructure network. The next part of um, our project was investigating what's happening with the gene and how is it changing. So to, to answer this objective, we work with more than 30 different biodiversity related layers that come from various sources. So the majority of the data came from the local source, which is an open uh, data portal from the city of Surrey. And another um, source of information was a regional study done by Metro Vancouver area. Example of such a local um, city level data is uh, the habitat suitability map. So basically habitat suitability is a property of that area to support biodiversity. The higher the ranking, the more useful it is and the more optimal it is for different species to inhabit that land. And the example of the regional study is the Metro Vancouver connectivity analysis. So although it's available for the whole Metro Vancouver area, we just clip the data to fit just to the Surrey boundary. So what does connectivity show is basically uh, this index shows you how connected the patch to each other. So the lighter the color it is, meaning that uh, the more important this area for connecting different habitats to each other. If you remove this habitat, it will affect the connectivity of the area quite drastically. So what can you do with these layers? We try to come up with some index of uh, how important the certain area is. So by combining these two metrics, we basically uh, calculated the critical area of connectivity index. So uh, the lighter the color basically show that this area is very important, not just in terms of connecting to different habitats, but also containing the uh, very, uh, very uh, important habitat types that can support a variety of species. The lower, uh, sorry, the darker the color, meaning that the area is either lacking the connectivity, so maybe it's not as crucial for connecting the patches, or might be having the habitats that are not optimal for uh, high biodiversity. So 
So as you can see from the map, there is a uh, couple examples of the areas where I have a very high uh, lighter green and yellow colors, meaning these areas have a high connectivity. Such areas are uh, like the, these two examples are basically the eastern part of the city and especially what's important, for example, the southern part of the area, uh, this area is characterized by high development, right, which possess additional rings, right, but you have a chance to remove very, um, very essential habitat for biodiversity. What also was important to note that uh, on this map, you also can see uh, corridors. Corridors, you can see is basically there's a naturally uh, straight um, land pieces that are designed to connect different habitats to each other. And you can see that uh, the uh, index for these areas are quite low, which is a bit alarming because these areas were designed to connect to different habitats and also be neutralized by species. But low connectivity index basically means that either it's not doing the job properly or doesn't contain a suitable habitats. So uh, what we also wanted to see how does the gene changes since the first time it was established. So there were two phases in this work. So the first phase of the uh, gene design was done in 2011. And they used the science approach, basically they collect all the environmental and ecological data to come up with the optimal places of such infrastructure. So as you can see, this is on the map, it's quite a large coverage of various areas that are connected to each other through different paths and corridors here. However, in phase two is what um, you can see on the map here in the dark green color is what the gene infrastructure network looks like nowadays. And this one, the area that receive a protection. So as you can see, there is a drastic change between phase one and phase two in terms of the amount of area that being preserved for uh, green infrastructure network. And if you calculate, uh, there are like um, possible to calculate it for number of cups. So the core areas in this network, there is like more than a half of the area being lost from phase one, phase two. Unfortunately, there is no record to determine what specifically caused such changes, but we can speculate that there are a lot of developmental pressures that can cause uh, certain areas to be excluded as a protected and also some of these uh, pathways that were identified in the phase one probably were not feasible already as the development already occurred and there is already a habitat loss happened there. So this layer that you see in green is was produced in 2014. So it's not the up-to-date knowledge. So we wanted to see how the gene could actually change due to the recent development that is happening in the area. And specifically it was very obvious um, could be seen from the maps, Google Maps. So if you overlay the hub, the green infrastructure network with the map of the city, you can see an uh, area highlighted in the orange that underline underneath you can see a building structure. So basically all the gene land in that area been replaced by strata development. And as a result, the area was lost. So we wanted to estimate how much loss due to the uh, placement of building is happening in the gene. So we calculated a total area of such building and produce the following map. So in the map you'll see again in green, it's your green infrastructure network and the color in red is the places where the uh, gene area was replaced by buildings. Um, of course, this is the minimum number of area being lost, as you know, when the development happened, it's not just the building that getting placed on the gene area, but it's also the area around the building can be modified and uh, maybe not destroyed, but uh, the different habitats can be replaced with some um, not optimal one. So in order to estimate how much of the damage is done or, uh, to this gene area, we introduced the buffers, 10 and 20 meter buffer area, and trying to calculate what percent of the area being lost. And if you can see the table above, there is a significant increase in the amount of area that's been um, modified, especially for sites and corridors um, on this map. So which is also raise some concern if we want to maintain the biodiversity in this city. Thank you. So the 
output of all these layers and the analysis resulted in a biodiversity atlas, which, as you can see, is just a visual aid to help pretty much anyone, but mostly important, the policymakers to actually uh, and see this, all this, all these uh, layers and all the data on top of each other. So we are going to do a little demonstration. Wonder if. Okay, I think that. The Share for everyone. So this is the uh, working draft of the biodiversity atlas, and it starts with a introduction. Yeah, I'm sharing that screen. Uh, it starts with a little introduction onto the different habitat types in Surrey, as we can see the whoa, the the two different layers. And it's just going to have a short description of what these two layers are, the purpose of it, which is, again, just a visual aid to help policymakers navigate through vast quantities of biodiversity related data. And it was originally inspired by a Barcelona atlas a few years back that, all, that also, similar to this, plots the city. Oh, but yeah, that's. Plots the city and it shows all the different types of occurrence data for any species, including plants, animals, and such. So here we see the dashboard to have a little more interactivity with some of the layers. And here you begin by selecting a type of group as all the species have been divided amongst birds, vertebrates, plants, insects, so here we'll just do a quick demonstration. We'll just select birds and insects. In the previous years, 20, uh, 2021, this one, which as Alex is mentioning, is only available for iNaturalist. And it, here it outlines wherever you zoom in what the species are. And in a second, it'll load, and we'll see how, there we go. So here we can look at the legend, what all this means. These are all the birds in green. Insects are red, which is what I selected, but right now they are clustered. So we see that there's 360 points in this cluster. And if we click on it, we'll get a little more description of it. The most predominant abundant type is birds here. And we can also select through more. So that's that type of um, management zone, which is one of the 14 that Surrey uses and is, divides the city. And the background in the different colors is how suitable each habitat is. So the blue, the more blue it is, the less um, suitable it is, which means that there are less species overall. It's the, the assessment that they made years ago. And the more red it is, is that it is very high. So we can continue zooming in, for example, here, and we see that there's a big cluster. And these are still all the species in the type. So we can plot all the other ones, plants and animals, and vertebrates. So we can really see in this highly suitable area what the actual observations are from, again, the sources that we got, which were iNaturalist and eBird. 
And so this atlas is presented as a story from ArcGIS. So it begins by specifying the species occurrence and then some of the green areas that we have and then the changes to gin that Yuli was mentioning as well. And then at the end, it's a story. We just mentioned like how suitable it is, where everyone is, where all the species are. And then it ends by um, talking about the species at risk, just so again, policymakers can uh, could really figure that <laughs> and see. So back. Yeah. So the yes. So then uh, the last thing was the connectivity study to just again assess the um, connectivity at uh, in Surrey, and it's a roadmap with nine easy steps where we first you first specialize. It's more of a guideline for future work, and that's uh, what we're developing to the goals and scopes of it. And then you start off with the part. You continue off with the partners who are involved directly with the in, with the assessment of the connectivity, and then the targets, which is like what you want the habitats at the end of it to look, how many, how big. Biology and ecology of the species you are using to assess the different habitats in Surrey. Uh, and this is all just a, an outline there. Uh, some barriers as well that will limit the connectivity between of the species, sorry. And it just continues on to the different modeling tools. Once you gather all the data, it'll help you estimate everything. Then the inputs again is finding and developing the model inputs for it. Would then uh, this is all helped uh, with some experts in the field, some biologists to make sure your data and and your approach is proper. So then the results should be verified as well at the end of it. And then interpretation, which again will most likely be to the policymakers in the city of Surrey. So just to conclude, uh, we have explored uh, the citizens' uh, science data to try to make assessment of the biodiversity in the city. And based on this data, we estimated that there are um, more than 2,000 different species over the six different kingdoms uh, that are present in the citizen size database. There are a lot of records of the species at risk and indicator species in the data that are useful um, sources to assess the biodiversity in the city. During the assessment of the gene network, we uh, saw that there are some changes to the gene that have been uh, done in the recent years and at least the 5% of the area have already been lost due to the placement of the building and at least 30% can be modified um, in the area, specifically targeting locations such as sites and uh, corridors. We designed the biodiversity atlas that helped to complement the um, data and the results that were produced in the study and might be an important tool to engage the audience into the biodiversity uh, of Surrey and also help the policymakers to use these maps to make some decisions in the future. And we also provide a guideline for the future connectivity study that is essential in order to get a updated current knowledge uh, uh, for the city of Surrey. Uh, as a last addition to our final report, uh, we were thinking about, oh, sorry, uh, there are, of course, we would like to acknowledge a list of the um, a limitation for the study. I'm not going to cover uh, them in this um, uh, presentation, but please free to ask the questions regarding the limitations of our study, and then we can talk a little bit more in the details. And the last uh, thing that we were doing for our final report is reflecting on the aspect of social good. Um, and especially we're working right as a data science for social good a project here. So we're trying to see the ways how we can engage the readers who are going to read the report and uh, what kind of uh, uh, audience we can um, encourage to do future actions. So we uh, created a section that called called call for action that basically uh, uh, what is it, the name? Basically, uh, uh, engage your different types of audience into promoting and doing the citizen science and biodiversity work. So, example of such audience will be um, management planners team. So, one of the major important things that they have to be is to be updated with all the data because the recent updates that have been done by many layers has happened in 2014, which is unacceptable considering how fast the series development and how fast the information is changing. 
there are a lot of uh, projects that data scientists can do. And one of the example is uh, working with the aerial pictures because also ones are updated annually and using the machine learning algorithm to be able to recognize all the green areas in the city and actually help to map these changes that are happening with gene over time. You can also engage a, 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 a more broader community, right? You can create a co placements or a volunteer opportunities, for example, high school and university students that will actually be trained and um, trained to do a field work or help to uh, record the certain species in the areas that lacking the data. And of course, there are a lot of citizen science initiatives that can be done in the area. For example, as you can uh, saw previously for the map, the data is very patchy and some of the areas didn't receive any attention, specifically the biodiversity in your backyard. So encouraging people to actually go into the backyard and explore what kind of species they can find there can greatly increase the effectiveness of the citizen science database. All right. And this was all thanks to all of our sponsors and all the help to the data science team, Kevin, Raymond, and everyone who is in here at the moment, everyone else that has helped as well, such as Lara, Josephine, and the TSSG traffic team for all the data they provided. And of course, this was, in, uh, we, we all needed to start somewhere. So we would like to thank Jana, Yola, and Nicholas for their, in their workshop tools so we could all have a good ground to start off and be able to manage this, uh, this great project. So thank you. And Hi. Um, yes, so I have, have some comments and, of course, multiple questions. And But I'd like to start off by thanking Alex and Yulia and Camilo. It's fantastic. Um, I just want to say that I'm, I've, it's been a real pleasure working with the three of you over the past 14 weeks. And um, I know that we still have some work to do in regards to the final report review. Um, it's on my plate <laughs> as soon as it's ready to be reviewed. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm just really, as I said, with your, in, your midterm presentation, I'm just very overwhelmed by the, by the effort and the, the degree of complexity and um, the amount of detailed work that's gone into this. And uh, it'll be a while before we can wrap our heads around how we absorb all of that. Oh, I'm sure we'll be having some continued discussions on how we how we take this work and export it and then import it and figure out a way to actually uh, ensure that it's, uh, it's available for us to use and then build on for the long term. Um, I did have some questions and this is uh, based on the midterm presentation, but also uh, discussions that we've had leading up to this point after that. Uh, with the eBird data, uh, my understanding is that we were looking at a way to get real-time data, um, the same way that we're able to get real-time data from iNaturalist, and that there was a way to get the 2021 info. That's the first question. Yeah, so the, uh, we put it as one of the limitations of our study is actually getting the real-time data. So what is currently Done in our analysis will take a snapshot. So we have uh, uploaded all the data, which is up to, I think, uh, uh, July months. But uh, citizen science data, basically having records entered every day, you see hundreds of new records appearing. So it's very important to keep in, to keep uh, keep up with the amount of data, the new data that's getting updated. And um, I naturalist it's a bit easier to update the data. We have not included in this work just because we were doing uh, the, uh, we were basically exploring the new tool. None of us ever worked with uh, JS and the story maps before. So we're not aware of the way to integrate the up-to-date information into the Atlas. However, we're pretty confident and we know how to do it with the R. So we know that we could have uh, 
design the script that would work in R, but we haven't figured out the way how to do it with the JS. I'm pretty sure it's possible because it's a powerful tool. We just, uh, our knowledge is not enough uh, now to make it uh, a real time update. With the eBird, the situation is a bit more complex because the data of their website is um, updated only once a year. So meaning that if you want to get the current data, you have to personally mail people and get uh, the newer, uh, newer records available to the system. So it's not possible to do the API uh, to automatically do this kind of update. So uh, with the eBird, it will be a, cha a challenge to update it unless it's done like once a year or like always contacting the people to ask for data. Okay. Okay, so from our end, we still need to get um, the integration, the, the bridging mechanism, the API built to get real time data from iNaturalist into that atlas. Yeah, yeah, we, we know how to do it at R and we already designed like uh, at least like a prototype how to do that, but uh, yeah, we, we're not familiar with QJS as well. Okay. Um, one thing that I noted when you were talking about the indicator species is I'm not sure where the eastern gray squirrel came from, but that's an introduced invasive species in Western Canada, and it actually should be Douglas squirrel, which is our native squirrel. I can double check the list again, but uh, we found that like I'm pretty sure the eastern gray squirrel might have come up on the list by accident. Okay, so, but um, have you, for the, the occurrence information for the indicator species, I just want to make sure that it's Douglas squirrel, not eastern gray squirrel, that you've captured data for. Yeah, we have for both. It was just that the eastern gray squirrel was actually seen more, which makes more sense because it is an invasive species and it's pretty much everywhere. But okay, I think like we might have to double check the list then that was posted on the biodiversity website. But yeah. All right. Well, I'm looking at the document right now, and it says Douglas squirrel. So I don't know. Yeah, we'll probably replace the squirrel because originally we have a Douglas square on our presentation, but because the map uh, was looking pretty empty because there were only few observations available, we'll probably replace it with a, a wrong species, uh, not in the indicator species list. Okay. So, but I want to make sure that there is no confusion because somebody looking at that who wouldn't know yeah yeah in the report everything is uh proper so there is uh if it's okay. uh, not a indicated species it will not be present in the <laughs> sorry i saw that and i was like uh <laughs> no <laughs> no please we're actually trying to that's a complex species we don't want to have that representing biodiversity Good point, I guess, Pam was making that uh, we did not really look into invasive species, but this kind of issue is also very crucial, right? That's important to uh, Yes, um, right, yeah. And definitely species like Eastern gray squirrel are, are very symptomatic of degraded habitat. So they're, they're more of a replacement species rather than a displacement species. Um, the other thing around the species at risk uh, we do know that, that it's extremely biased in regards to the occurrence information we have um, based on work federally and provincially for species at risk conservation and recovery. Um, typically, the majority of them are found on private land. So that's why we, we don't get information about where they occur for the most part, um, unless that information is provided, at least for the city of Surrey and typically for most other cities as part of any type of environmental assessment or for us an ecosystem development plan um, where that actually gets triggered through development. Um, did you integrate the critical habitat layers that I sent you? Uh, yes. For that? Yeah, we can also add them to the atlas if needed. Um, well, they're publicly available on Cosmos for us, and we get them directly from the federal government. The provincial government also purveys that information, but as a as a single file, so they don't split out individual species. That's why I prefer the federal um, federal information. Uh, one thing we we talked about this as well uh, after the connectivity analysis for Metro Vancouver came came out. Um, and these are some of the questions that uh, Josephine will know that I raised when we had the initial presentation on that. 
uh, through Metro Vancouver is that it is tied to specific indicator species. And do you talk about that in the report? Because it wasn't really referenced in the presentation. Yeah, so um, the way the connectivity work is done is basically using only a representative species because you can't model like 2,000 species at once. So you choose a, a representative species that represents a certain habitat and then model it. So the original study was done on, I think, um, eight uh, different species and only four of them were present for theory. So that's why we were saying that it will be good to actually have a connectivity study done for theory species using the indicator species. However, yeah. again, uh, after reading some papers, uh, this kind of um, approach of selecting a certain species to represent the whole guild of animals should be taken with caution because mm -hmm. uh, habitat loss can affect those species, although they occupy the same habitat, they can be affected very differently. Yes. So, we actually maybe need to do a bit more analysis to see uh, maybe even the original study done by Metro Vancouver will be uh, quite appropriate for um, City of Surrey just in, because uh, this kind of uh, analysis done is basically what they're doing is the habitat connectivity, right? The types of habitats which is uh, present in the City of Surrey too. So there's probably a little bit more did, uh, like review have to be done for that part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we do know that um, you know, at the sort of the more the local and site level that we see particular associations with a number of species that um, they may not sort of meet the, the generalized criteria around those associations for connectivity. Um, and that's always a bit of the caveat in regards to transferring something from a, a large landscape scale down to the site level. Um, just a bit of a correction. So you were talking about one of your slides that the biodiversity conservation strategy was the second phase of the sustainability charter. Yes. Um, so the, the biodiversity conservation strategy was basically a, sort of the the next stage of the ecosystem management study. Oh, um, look at actually from the report that's what they're calling yeah. that ecosystem management study that the report that was published they called it the first phase of the chapter oh okay so i would yeah i would maybe refine that um, okay. because it sounds a bit confusing that that somehow it it's the next iteration of the sustainability charter yeah maybe when we submit our final report you can make those uh um Okay. Correction, I will try to, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's correct and just to read it by you. Okay, and, and the other thing too, and of course we've had these discussions, um, you know, in, in, in between uh, over the 14 weeks is that the Green Infrastructure Network is not legally binding. Um, so we don't really have the ability to enforce it uh, other than where components of the gin are or do trigger regulatory um, components. So mainly aquatic habitat, wetlands and uh, watercourses, riparian areas, which is why we tend to have a lot of challenges with mainly terrestrial habitat um, being eaten away. Um, and it's very similar to what happened on Vancouver Island. They were kind of the first out the gate in BC with developing a sensitive ecosystem inventory um, back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And when they went back to take a look at that to see, okay, well, how well have local governments used the SEI? Um, it was something that was developed in partnership with the federal government at the time. Um, they noticed that when they looked at, you know, areas of high ecological sensitivity that had been flagged in the sensitive ecosystem inventory that they found very similar things where it was ecologically rich when the SEI was done. And then they went back and take a look at the development patterns for respective municipalities and a number of those polygons were built on. Um, so this is just really reflective of, you know, the lack of compulsory tools that local governments have and the pressures that were under. Um, and it's, it's going to be kind of an interesting conversation when we look at your analysis about areas of the gin that, that have been lost and, you know, where that conversation is going to go 
Um, as I said, I don't have a good answer for you uh, in regards to why things like the sites were not included um, in, in the GIN versus the way they're included in the EMS layers. Uh, and you know what the, the major, what pieces lost and why when we transitioned from the EMS to the formal green infrastructure network in the biodiversity conservation strategy. Um, so that, that's it from me. Um, and we'll probably be chatting more when I start to review the report. Thank you for your question. Fantastic job, folks. Just really very grateful for your work.